Well, good morning, mums and dads, boys and girls, and teachers, and everybody else that's here. Uh, first of all, while people are still coming in, I know the traffic's back, back a little out there, so what we'll do is I'll just show you a little bit about the Creation Museum and the Ark in Canada. How many of you have already been to the Creation Museum? Oh, there's a number of you. How many have been to the Ark? Well, I'll tell you what, I want you children to pester all your parents for the rest of the year to make sure they take you to the Creation Museum and to the Ark. The Creation Museum is we in northern Kentucky, you, so it's easy to get make our there prayer. from here. You just go to Interstate 75 and head north. That's basically it. And uh, you'll go past the Ark, and uh, you'll be able to find the Creation Museum very easily. And so the Creation Museum was opened in 2007, and you can see it there. It's actually a walk through the Bible using life-size exhibits. So you walk through the whole Bible, and we answer skeptical questions to help people know that they can trust God's Word and trust God's word in uh, Genesis right from the very beginning. And then we present the gospel very, very clearly. We have planetarium, special effects theatre, beautiful gardens, a petting zoo. And the gardens are just starting to come back now. Isn't, isn't today the first day of spring, I think? First day of spring. So here we are. So now all, now all the trees can finally start budding. <laughs> Actually, they've been budding in our area for some time, and then they suddenly found out it was winter again. Uh, but the Ark Encounter, a life-size Noah's Ark, and we opened the Ark Encounter last year, and people come from all over the world to the Creation Museum and the Ark, and you can go and actually experience the size of the Ark. It's a timber frame structure filled with exhibits, and you walk through them. And if any school groups here, or you might be able to do this with a homeschool group, if you've got the minimum numbers of 30, we even uh, allow sleepovers at the Ark and the Creation Museum, and you have to call up to find the information about that. I think a minimum group is 30. And we have a zoo there as well as a petting zoo and we have other things that we're opening too. And then uh, I thought I would also show you at uh, the Ark, we, we, at the Ark we actually have uh, zip lines at the Ark. Let me see if I can find them. Here we go. There we go. We have zip lines at the Ark where you actually uh, zip across uh, the valleys and we have zip lines at the Cretia Museum as well and uh, if you can imagine zipping across valleys right beside the Ark. I don't know too many other places in the world you can zip beside the Ark uh, but you can there at the Cretia Museum. There's going to be nine miles of zip lines actually uh, at the Ark and then at the Creation Museum the difference with the zip lines at the Creation Museum I thought I had them here, I don't have them. Well the difference is that you actually go through uh, the trees and at the Ark you go over the trees. So there we are. And you can find out more information at arkencounter.com. There's something to do for the summer, spring break, or come at Christmas time too. In December we have special lights and live nativity and spectacular lights. I, I believe they're some of the most exquisite you'd ever see in America and we're going to have them at the Ark this year as well. So Christmas time has a different flavour or come a couple of different times. Okay, well, we're going to get underway. So, boys and girls, everyone sit up nice and straight. Ready? Take a deep breath. All right. Now, first of all, I have a number of rules. Are you ready? Rule number one, don't drop anything on the floor. Rule number two, don't drop anything on the floor. Rule number three, don't drop anything on the floor. What's rule number four? Excellent. Rule number five, when I'm speaking, you don't. That's pretty easy, isn't it? And you sit there and listen. But there are times I'm going to get you to call out. And when you call out, I want you to call out in a nice, big, loud voice. And other times I'm going to get you to put your hands up. So we're going to try that, putting your hands up. I'm going to count to three. And on the count of three, you put your hands up. Okay, you ready? One, two, three. Oh, that was so slow. That was pathetic. Okay, I'm going to pretend that never happened. We're going to try it again. You ready? One, two, three. You know, you're still a bit slow. One more time. One, two, three. Okay, that's getting better. All right. Okay, so we ready to get underway? All right, no talking. And there are times when I'm going to say to you, no talking. Nice and quiet. Excellent. That's just how you should be. And I'm sure you're like that at home all day long. All right, put your hands up if you've heard of the word evolution. Oh, look at that. I think just about everyone's heard of that. That's true all around the world, actually. Mums and dads and teachers, take note. Put your hands up if you've heard people supposedly evolved from ape-like creatures. Yeah, look at that. We've all heard of that too. And put your hand up if you've heard that dinosaurs supposedly lived millions of years ago. Yeah, we've all heard of that too. Well, boys and girls, I'm going to tell you right from the start here this morning, 
that I don't believe in evolution. Evolution is the idea some people have to try to explain life without God. They just think somehow the universe came about, somehow matter formed, somehow matter turned into life. I mean, you think about that. Life is so, so complex. In fact, the whole universe is very complex, but life is so much more complex. Look, how could anything like that come about by natural chance random processes? Here's a church building. And you imagine church building like this one here. It's a big complex that we have here at Woodstock. How did this building get here? I know what happened. When I came in here, I said, somebody put a load of bricks, then they put an explosion under it, and look what happened. There you are. Then you get the building. Is that what happened? No. Of course, we know that there had to be architects and engineers, and there had to be carpenters and people who built a building like this. They had to put a lot of design into it. Boys and girls, your brain is so much more complicated than a building like this. If somebody had to design and build a building, don't you think somebody far greater had to design and build us? And I believe that to be and know that to be the God of the Bible, the God of creation. So no, I don't believe in evolution. Evolution doesn't make any sense. You know what evolution is? It's a fairy tale. It's a fairy tale people have to try to explain life without God because they don't want to believe in God. Well, I don't believe in evolution. And I don't believe dinosaurs lived millions of years ago. We're going to talk about that today as we go on. And I certainly don't believe we evolved from ape-like creatures. I mean, did your grandfather look like that? I don't think so. How about your grandmother? She looked like that? You, you know, one of the things I noticed, I noticed as you were coming in this morning, you walked in like this. Were you all walking in like that? No, of course not, because you don't walk like some ape or anything like that. You see, boys and girls, you didn't come from ape-like creatures. In fact, I want to do an experiment. And teachers and adults and older kids have to do this too. Put your hands in the air. Can you do that? Touch your fingers with your thumb. Okay, and now touch your big toe and your little toes like that. Can you do that? <laughs> <laughs> hope you can't because if you can you shouldn't be here because I want you to have a look up here and here's a human foot and here's a chimp's foot but it doesn't look like a foot it looks like what a hand you see it's designed to do what it does and you're designed to do what you do and you don't do what they do and they don't do what you do in fact here's a man he's looking at a chimp and he says I can think compose music build bridges fly airplanes make computers what can you do and all he can think about is what banana that's the wrong way to say that say banana Oh, that is so much better. So it sounds like music to my ears as you say that. Oh, yes, yeah, so much better. Well, boys and girls, I certainly don't believe we came from ape-like creatures. I don't believe in millions of years. I don't believe in evolution. I believe what the Bible says. You know, the Bible is a very special book. There's no other book like the Bible in, in the whole universe. It's God's book to us to tell us about who we are, where we came from, how he made the universe. In fact, you know what I call the Bible? I call it the history book of the universe. Let's say it together. You ready? The history book of the universe. One more time. The history book of the universe. That's what it is. It's a history book. It's God's history to us. And at the Creation Museum, we call it the seven seas of history, where we go through creation, corruption, catastrophe, confusion, Christ, cross, consummation, where we're going through the history of the universe, where God created a perfect world, then sin and death entered the world, and there was a global flood in Noah's day, and the Tower of Babel. Uh, after the flood, we've formed different people groups, and then God's Son steps into history to be the God-man about 2,000 years ago, the babe in a manger, to die on a cross, be raised from the dead. And one day, there's going to be a new heavens and new earth to come. And boys and girls, think about it. All these events in history here have all happened, and we're somewhere right there, right now, waiting for this final event here. Think about that. Isn't it an exciting time in history? It is. Well, I'm going to show you how when you take God's history book, it is very easy to explain dinosaurs. And in fact, the way I explain dinosaurs, instead of using seven C's, I change those seven C's into what I call seven F's, seven ages of dinosaurs. And we're going to learn the seven ages of dinosaurs here this morning. I want you to think about this. See, People who believe in evolution of millions of years say there was an age of dinosaurs 70 to 200 million years ago. I want you to say this when somebody asks you, do you believe in the age of dinosaurs? I want your answer to be this. I don't believe in the age of dinosaurs. I believe in seven ages of dinosaurs. Can you remember that? <laughs> so when I ask you, do you believe in the age of dinosaurs? Here's how you say it. No, I believe in seven ages of dinosaurs. You ready? Do you believe in the age of dinosaurs? 
No, I believe in seven ages of dinosaurs. Exactly. And I put them in this book actually called Dinosaurs for Kids and we have a lot about dinosaurs in there. But as we go through these, by the end of today, by the end of this session, you're going to know all seven ages and it's very easy to learn. So as I put them on the screen, let's say them first of all and then we're going to go through them one at a time. So the first age of dinosaurs, formed. Say formed. Second age, fearless. fearless. Third age, fallen. fallen. Fourth age, flood. flood. Fifth age, faded. faded. Sixth age, found. found. Seventh age, which is the age we live in today, fiction. fiction. And you know what fiction means? Not true. What does fiction mean? Not. Not true. And you know why I call the seventh age, the age we live in today, fiction? Because we're told a lot of things that are not true through the media, through a lot of the education system, through a lot of museums. Do you know two of the things we're going to learn today that are not true? Evolution and millions of years. Do you know what I call evolution and millions of years? Fiction. What's evolution and millions of years? Fiction. Exactly. Not true. So we're going to start and we're going to start with the first age of dinosaurs. What was the first age of dinosaurs? Formed. And we're going to learn all about dinosaurs and all sorts of other things as well as we go through the seven ages of dinosaurs. Formed. God made everything. When did he form the dinosaurs? Well, he made everything in six days and rested for one day. Stop right there for a moment. How many of you have a 10-day week at your house? Hmm. How many people have a 13-day week? Okay. How many people have a seven-day week? Wow, look at that, a seven-day week. Have you ever thought, why do we have a seven-day week? Why not an eight-day? Why not a four-day? Why not a 13-day? You know why you have a seven-day week? Because God made everything in six days and rested for one day, and six plus one equals what? Seven. Even people who don't believe the Bible have a seven-day week, and they don't realize when they're having a seven-day week, they're saying, God's word is true. <laughs> isn't, that, isn't that great to know? <laughs> it is. Hey, those days... They couldn't be millions of years, by the way, boys and girls. Think about that. If they were millions of years, that would mean God made everything in six millions of years and rested for millions of years. Then you could say to your teachers, didn't do my homework, why not? I mean, the millions of years rest. <laughs> I don't think they'd take that excuse very well, do you? No, not at all. No, God made everything in six days and rested for one. That's actually where the seven-day week comes from. It doesn't come from astronomy. It only comes from the Bible. And then God tells us what he did on each of those six days. And tell, it goes through day one, two, three, four, five, and six. And on day six, he made the land animals and he made man. You know how he made the land animals? He said, let the earth bring forth the land animals. You know how he made man? He said, let us make man in our image. Did you know no animals were made in God's image? You know what, mums, dads, and teachers, a lot of times our books have man in the animal kingdom. You know what we really need to do? If we're going to be true to our Christian worldview, man should be separated out. Humans should be out in a separate category because they're different to the animals. They're made in the image of God. I want you to say after me, boys and girls, I'm not just an animal. Can you say that? You're not just an animal. You have a body like a mammal's body, that's true, but you're different to the animals because we're made in the image of God. I want you to say after me, I'm made in the image of God. Can you say that? Exactly. And that's very, very important. Well, you know, when God made the animals, some of the best animals, in fact, I think the best animals ever made live in Australia. Now, you might wonder why I think that. I'm not biased in any way whatsoever. That's what I really believe. Just because I come from Australia doesn't mean that I'm biased that way. But uh, I'm sure you've seen animals like this. Who knows the name of that one? Koala. I know every boy and girl wants to go to Australia to cuddle a koala. Of course, one of the best kept secrets in Australia is in the wild they're smelly, flea bitten vomits that rip your eyeballs out. But we don't tell too many people about that. Okay? But the koala is a marsupial. And there's another marsupial. In fact, we have this other marsupial in our zoo at the Ark and in our petting zoo at the Creation Museum. What's it called? Kangaroo. You know, boys, you know what's fascinating about a kangaroo? You know, when a kangaroo is born, it's like a little red jelly bean. So about half an inch long, it has two legs and a mouth, and it, and it can't see, 
and it knows where to go, what to do, and how to do it, and it crawls itself up its mother's pouch, and knows where to go, what to do, and how to do it, and it crawls itself into its mother's pouch, and knows where to go, what to do, and how to do it, and attaches itself to its mother's milk to develop from there. Who thinks that happened by chance, random, evolutionary processes over millions of years? That wouldn't make sense, would it? You know what I say to my kids? Well, now I say to my grandkids, because we have 16 grandkids, you know what I say to my grandkids? It's designed to do what it does do, what it does do, it does do well, doesn't it? Don't you think you think it does do you? I do hope you do too, do you? <laughs> Can you say that? No. You can't say that? Okay, We're, I'm going to teach you how to say that in a moment. We're going to learn how to say that. So you see, boys and girls, I certainly don't believe in evolution. Hey, here's another one of my favorite animals. It's a wombat. Can you say wombat? wombat. Now, a wombat is a marsupial, and he has a pouch, but the difference with the wombat is the pouch faces backwards, so the young have to jump in at the rear end. You know, I had an evolutionist once who said to me, if God designed the wombat, why did he give it a backward-facing pouch? Well, that's easy, because a wombat tunnels under the ground. Can you imagine what would happen if the pouch faced forwards? It would fill up with dirt, and you'd get fossilized wombats real quickly, wouldn't you? <laughs> you know what I say to my grandkids? It's designed to do what it does do, what it does do, what it does do well, doesn't it? Don't you think I think it does do you? I do hope you do too, do you? Can you say that yet? You can't say that yet? Come on, we're going to learn that. Well, my favorite animal of all time, let me see if you can guess the name of it. You ready? What's my favorite animal of all time? The platypus. You know why it's my favorite animal of all time? It is so confusing to the evolutionists. When they first discovered a platypus in 1797 and sent it back to England, you know the scientists in England thought somebody had obtained all these different animals, cut bits and pieces of them and stitched them together to make a platypus. And you know why they thought that? Because it has a bill like a duck and a beaver like tail and hair like a bear and web feet like an otter and claws like a reptile, lays eggs like a turtle, feeds a shungle milk like a mammal, has spurs like a rooster and poison like a snake. I mean, if it evolved, it evolved from everything. <laughs> you know what I think? I think that every time an evolutionist looks at the platypus, I think God smiles because I think he made it just for them. That's why I love the pla And guess what I say to my grandchildren? It's designed to do what it does do, what it does do, what it does do well, doesn't it? Don't you think I think it does do you? I do hope you do too, do you? Can you say that yet? You can't? Okay, we're going to say it together and we're going to learn it. Okay, are you ready? So just follow me on the count of three. One, two, three. It's designed to do what it does do, what it does do, it does do well, doesn't it? Yes, it does. I think it does. Do you? I do. Hope you do too. Do you? Okay. Sort of all right. Take a deep breath. Energy to your brain. We're going to do it again and go faster. Okay, make sure you keep up with me. So get, to, get, get your energy up. You ready? On the count of three. One, two, three. It's designed to do what it does do, what it does do, it does do well, doesn't it? Yes, it does. I think it does. Do you? I do. Hope you do too, do you? Okay, let's take it to another level. Are you ready? Take a deep breath. Quick, get some more oxygen to your brain. This one's a little faster again. Are you ready? On the count of three. One, two, three. It's designed to do what it does do, what it does do, it does do well, doesn't it? Yes, it does. I think it does. Do you? I do. Hope you do too, do you? One more time. Okay, let's see how good you are. On the count of three, take a deep breath. Okay, get your hands ready by your side. You ready? On the count of three, we'll see how good you are. Keep up with me. You can listen for your parents and your teachers. See how good they are too. Okay, you ready? One, two, three. It's designed to do what it does do, what it does do, it does do well, doesn't it? Yes, it does. I think it does. Do you? I do. Hope you do too. Do you? No, it's pretty good. You can give yourselves a clap. I think you did okay. <laughs> hey, boys and girls, isn't it fun when you're learning about God's world and God's word? We can make it fun, can't we? Of course we can. We can have fun. That's why people have said to me, why do you have zip lines at the ark? Because Christians can have fun too. <laughs> exactly. And we can. Well, you know what? I certainly don't believe in evolution. I believe that God designed all the animals and plants. And you know, when God made the land animals, he brought them to Adam to name. And you can imagine Adam naming the animals. Wow, Dodo, that's a great name. Bear, yeah, I think I like that one. Actually, we don't know what names that Adam used. But do you know why God did that? To show him that there was no one that looked like him. 
I mean, you see male and female dodo, male and female deer, male and female chimp. Where's Mrs. Adam? He couldn't see anyone like him. He didn't even think a female chimp was like him. He realized they were different. And so you know what God did? He wanted to show Adam that he was alone. No one else was made in his image. He put Adam to sleep and out of his side he made the first woman. What was her name? Eve. When God made the first woman, he made the first marriage, which means marriage is to be a man and a woman. Because who invented marriage? God. Exactly. Who would have ever thought, mum and dad, that we have to overemphasize that in this day and age? But God made the first marriage, Adam and Eve. And hey, boys and girls, have a look here. Let me see. What is this animal here? Dinosaur? What's that one look like? Okay, and what about this one here? Dinosaur? Are you saying that God made dinosaurs alongside of Adam and Eve? Well, um, God made all the land animals alongside of Adam and Eve, and dinosaurs are land animals, so God made dinosaurs alongside of Adam and Eve. And I can prove that to you. I have a photograph that Eve took in the Garden of Eden, and uh, you can see T-Rex standing there and you can imagine if there was a newspaper in the Garden of Eden or, or way back in the days when newspapers told the truth, that was a long time ago, and you can imagine the headlines, dinosaurs made on six day, read all about it and here they are, dinosaurs and people living happily together. And then I have boys and girls say, Mr. Ham, well how long ago was that? Well, when you add up all the dates in the Bible, the Bible says God made everything in six days and Adam was made on day six. And it tells you when Adam had his, uh, their first uh, son uh, that's recorded in the Bible at 130 years old, Seth and so on. And you add up all those dates, it comes to about 6,000 years. And of course, I have boys and girls say, Mr. Ham, wait a minute, only 6,000 years? What about those scientists who say the universe and the earth are billions of years old? Okay, well, I'm going to teach you something really important. I want to teach you how to think. The problem with a lot of our education today, it doesn't teach people how to think. I want to teach you how to think. There was a man called Job, and Job lived after the flood of Noah's day, and God was showing Job some things, and one of the things that God said to Job was this, where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? In other words, Job, did you see me make the earth? Were you there when it happened? Were you there when it came about? And helping Job understand only God knows everything about what's happened. And so based on that verse, to help you understand these issues, I want you to think about this. The next time somebody says millions of years ago in a nice polite way, you say, excuse me, were you there? Can you remember that? <laughs> That's just like God was saying to Job. Job, were you there? Did you see it happen? Hey, boys and girls, think about this. When somebody tells you, you know, the universe came about by a big bang. Were they there? Have they got a movie of it? Of course not. You know, the only one who's always been there is God. And we have his word. And he tells us he made the earth first. And he didn't make the sun till day four and so on. And so the next time somebody says millions of years, what's the question you ask? Yeah. Were you there? Now, I've had boys and girls come to me and say, Mr. Ham, we asked the evolutionists, were you there? And they said, no, we weren't. And then they looked at me and they said, but... You weren't either. What do I say now? Oh, here's what you say now. When you say, were you there? And they say, no, but you weren't either. You say, no, I wasn't, but I know someone who was, and I have his word. Are you interested? See, let me ask you a question. Has any human being always been there? Yes or no? No. Does any human being know everything? No. Has any scientist always been there? No. Does any scientist know everything? No, you tell me, who is the only one who's always been there? God. Who is the only one who knows everything? God. Who should you always trust first, God or the scientist? God. And I want you to remember that, boys and girls. You always trust God's word first because he knows everything. He's always been there. So the next time somebody says millions of years, what's the question you ask? Were you there? Remember that. Well... I, you know, I was just looking at this audience and thinking, okay, so you're mostly American boys and girls. I really think Australian boys and girls are so much more intelligent than Americans. You agree with me, right? You don't? Look, 
I'm an Australian and I've been in Australia many times in America and I'm telling you Australian boys and girls are much more intelligent. Look, I'm going to prove it to you, okay? I'm going to give you an intelligence test. Here's what I do in Australia. I put up pictures of dinosaurs and I say to the, to the young people, as soon as you see the picture, call out its name. And they know them just like that. It's amazing. It is. I don't have to say a word and they know it. I want to see if you're as good. You ready? Here we go. What's the name of that one? Wow. I didn't even say a word and you seem to know it too. That's, a, that's amazing. I found boys and girls all seem to know these dinosaurs. Wow, I'm impressed. Okay, we'll try another one. What's the name of this one? Wow, you are as intelligent as Australian boys and girls. Okay, now I'm impressed. All right, I, I tell you what, let me, see, let me see. I wonder if you know, no calling out, just sit there quiet. I wonder if you know the name of my very favorite dinosaur. See, there's, there's hundreds of names of dinosaurs. There's all these dinosaurs. I tell you what I'm going to do. Have a think what you believe might be my very favorite dinosaur. And I'm going to count to three. And then yell out in a loud voice what you think it is and we'll see if you're right. Are you ready? What is the name of my very favorite dinosaur on account of? One, two, three. Yeah. Aha, T-Rex. I heard T-Rex. I heard some other names, but I heard T-Rex more than any other. You know why I like T-Rex? Because I like his teeth. Doesn't that look like one of your teachers when they smile at you asking if you've done your homework? Yeah, T-Rex, there we are. Now, then I have boys and girls say, Mr. Ham, but I don't find the word dinosaur in the Bible. Why don't I find the word dinosaur? Well, you don't find the word email in the Bible, do you? Do you find Nintendo in the Bible? PlayStation 3 or 4? No, you know why? They're all modern words. You see, the King James Bible, for instance, was first translated into English in 1611, but the word dinosaur wasn't invented until 1841. Let's say that date, 1841. Let's say it again, 1841. Okay, okay let me see how good you are. When was the word dinosaur first invented? 1841. Exactly, 1841. And the man who invented that word was a man called Sir Richard Owen, and, and he had... Uh, the bones of creatures like Megalosaurus and Iguanodon and he wanted a name for these creatures and he invented the name dinosaur. So mums and dads and teachers, just think for a moment when people say to you, well God didn't make the dinosaurs because the word dinosaur is not in the Bible and we don't read about dinosaurs in the Bible. See, they don't understand what they're talking about because the word dinosaur is just a modern word that was made up to actually be a word for uh, a, a number of different uh, types of land animals that have particular features. That's all it is. So, of course the word dinosaur wouldn't be there in, in, in the Bible because it's just a made-up modern word. But you know what? Land animals with specific characteristics that come under dinosaurs, did God make them on day six? Well, he made all the land animals on day six, all the kinds of the land animals. So, of course, what we today call dinosaurs, and a couple of different groups of dinosaurs, and what we call dinosaurs today, they're part of the land animal kinds that God made on day six. See? So it's not a difficult topic at all. You know what's interesting? The word dinosaur wasn't invented until 1841. And we believe, certainly, that what we call dinosaurs uh, live beside Adam. We believe they lived after the flood. And we'll explain that as we go on here in a moment. And lived in, could, have been, could have even lived in recent times. I, I wonder if there was a name people had for these creatures. Is there a name that you hear all over the world which is uh, very interesting? I mean, think about the fact we have flood legends all over the world because there was a real flood, Noah's flood. And we also have what other sorts of legends all over the world? Dragons. We think many of your dragon legends could possibly be references to some of the creatures that we today call dinosaurs because some of their descriptions actually fit and the carvings of them fit what we'd expect of some of the dinosaurs. So it's very possible these creatures were known in recent times, they call them dragons, but in 1841 there was a word invented 
called dinosaur. And you know, people also have the wrong idea. They think dinosaurs were all great big monsters. If you brought them in here, they'd had their heads through the roof of the church here. But actually, there's a couple of different groups of, of dinosaurs. Uh, one group, the average size about the size of a bison or buffalo. The other group, about the average size of a sheep. And in fact, there were dinosaurs as small as chickens. If they'd have survived to today, we would have had Kentucky Fried Dinosaur instead of Kentucky Fried Chicken, wouldn't we? And you know what's interesting? Evolutionists believe that when you're eating Kentucky Fried Chicken, that you're eating dinosaur because they believe that dinosaurs evolved into birds. Doesn't make sense, does it? That's why they, they, they can't have dinosaurs living today or anything, or living beside man, because they say, no, dinosaurs became extinct about 65 million years ago because to them they evolved into birds. We live near the Cincinnati Zoo. And the Cincinnati Zoo, it's a really good zoo and we often take our grandkids there. But they have a big aviary and they have all these little birds in there. And as you walk into the aviary, they have a sign. It says, dinosaurs went extinct millions of years ago or did they? And then they say, no, birds are essentially modern short-tailed feathered dinosaurs. So then you walk in and you look at all the birds flying around and you say, wow, dinosaurs. Isn't that silly? It is. Because they believe in evolution doesn't make any sense. Hey, boys and girls, there's no way dinosaurs could have evolved into birds. <laughs> it, w it, w it wouldn't make sense at all. And then at Thanksgiving, you'd have a hard time figuring out uh, how to get your turkey, wouldn't you? Hey, you know what? They try to say the grand dinosaurs grew feathers to turn into birds. Do you know if you look at a bird, you know something you notice about birds that have feathers? They have to actually turn their neck around and preen their feathers to keep them lubricated. Can you imagine a T-Rex or something trying to turn around to preen its feathers? Said, no, birds have a special bone structure, they have a special air system, uh, they uh, are designed for flight, very, very different. So I certainly don't believe dinosaurs evolved into birds. And then we get closer to T-Rex and people say, Mr. Ham, don't you think Adam would have been frightened of T-Rex seeing all those teeth? Don't you think Adam would have been frightened that T-Rex was considering lunch? Well, originally T-Rex's lunch was only plants, along with all the other land animals. Really? Yeah, because now we come to the second age of dinosaurs. What's the second age? Fearless. Fearless. First age was what? And second age? Fearless. Fearless. You see, when God first made all the land animals and Adam and Eve, what did he say to Adam and Eve? He said, you can eat all the fruit, fruit from the trees. And then he said, the animals eat the plants. Originally, all animals in Adam and Eve were vegetarian. Now, hand up those of you who ate some dead chicken this week. Oh, you had some dead chicken? Oh, lots of dead chickens in Atlanta. Okay. Well, that's okay because after the flood, not before, but after the flood in Genesis 9 verse 3, God said, just as I gave you the plants to eat, now I give you everything. God changed our diet. But it wasn't so originally. Something changed in this world. See, originally after God made everything, he said everything was what? Very good. Let's say that. Everything was? very good hey boys and girls if you look at the world today it's not very good people die it's a sad world people get sick there are tidal waves there are earthquakes there are terrorists it's not a very good world today is it and you say did God make the world like that no he did not when God made the world it was what very good now let me tell you what happened because something changed but mums dads and teachers I know there are many people that believe in millions of years even in our churches but you see if you believe in millions of years you've got a major problem the idea of millions of years came from atheists people who rejected the Bible who said that all those fossil layers with the fossils were not from the flood of Noah's day they were laid down millions of years before man and if you believe that, then you've got death millions of years before man. But after God made man, God said everything was very good. And you know what we find in the fossil record? 
evidence of animals eating each other and bones in their stomachs. But originally God said, we're all vegetarian. You know what else you find in the bones in the fossil record? Diseases like brain tumors and cancer and arthritis. But God said everything he made was very good. God wouldn't call cancer very good. Everything originally when God made it, there was no death. There was no millions of years of death or disease. It was all perfect. And the animals of man were vegetarian. Their diet was like that. Doesn't that look nice? It's because it comes from Australia. That's why it looks so nice. <laughs> and here's T-Rex chomping away on plants and fruits. And then I, I have boys and girls and some of these secularists, they mock us and they say, wait a minute, wait a minute. You're saying T-Rex was even a vegetarian? Uh, look, they have sharp teeth. It's obvious that they're a meat eater. Boys and girls, I want, to sh I want you to show all the mums and dads and teachers here that you can think logically, much more logically than, than an atheist or a secularist. You ready? The neck, when anyone says to you, has sharp teeth, I want you to, to finish my sentence here. Just because an animal has sharp teeth doesn't mean it's a meat eater. It just means it has sharp teeth. Exactly. It just means it has sharp teeth. And you can eat teeth for eating all sorts of things, chomping on watermelons and potatoes and branches. You need sharp teeth uh, for that. Actually, mums and dads and teachers, a lot of times I think we teach our kids incorrectly. Some of our books say, this is the teeth of a herbivore, this is the teeth of a carnivore. By the way, that teaches them that it's always been a carnivore. You know what we should be teaching? These are sawing teeth, these are ripping teeth, these are grinding teeth, these, you get the idea? Equate teeth with function, but in a fallen world, as we'll find out, now some teeth are used for different things. See, look at this skull. You look at that and say, wow, that was a savage animal. What did that eat? Well, that's the skull of a giant panda that eats mainly bamboo. Look at this animal. Now, there's a savage little creature in Australia. It flies around Australia and just rips into fruit. It's a fruit bat. And this monkey from South America, you say, what does it eat? Your answer might be, hmm, by the look of that, anything it wants. <laughs> Actually, it's a vegetarian. Did you know that most bears are primarily vegetarian? Even a grizzly bear eats grass after hibernation. Even in Australia, the polar bear in SeaWorld had a big sign up saying what it ate. And it starts off with a variety of red meat, but then notice everything else. Lettuce and apples and oranges and sweet potato and carrots and grapes. And so it goes on. Just because an animal has sharp teeth doesn't mean it's a meat eater. It means it has what? Sharp teeth. You know, there was a documentary on the Discovery Channel. And uh, this was done over um, in Australian waters. And they wanted to test what the great white shark like. Because I've had people say to me, have you seen the great white shark with all those sharp teeth? There's no way it would eat plants. Oh, okay, well, let's see. So they decided to do a bait test on the great white shark. And they put in the water squid and tuna and kelp. Kelp is like uh, a plant in the ocean, seaweed. Let's see what happened. Oops, let me try it again. in the bait to begin the test. First tuna, squid, and kelp. Okay, the three baits are in. We've already seen how hard they hit the tuna in Australia. And if scent is a factor at all, the tuna or squid should go first. Whoa! She just took a small bite out of the kelp. Incredible. She's coming back around for a second pass. It went for the kelp again. The shark ignored the tuna and the squid and took the kelp. Now, don't sit there and say, oh, we don't have to worry about swimming in the ocean then. We'll just tie some kelp to our belt. And when the great white shark comes along, he'll take the kelp and leave me. Well, do you know what happened in that documentary? The great white shark came back and took the tuna and the squid as well. <laughs> because in a fallen world, they'll eat anything, right? But my point is, they do eat plants. And originally, all the animals ate plants. In fact, this is a little video of an alligator eating comports uh, from a tree, eating fruit from a tree. And I want us to think about the... See, we live in a fallen world, and people, because we live in a fallen world, we don't know what a perfect world's like. But you have to stand back and look at the picture God gives us. Originally, 
All the animals were very good. Man was very good. God said they only ate plants. They were all living happily together. And you might say, Mr. Ham, but we don't see that today. Today we see people eating animals, animals eating people, animals eating animals. Yeah, it's a very different world because we now come to the next age of dinosaurs. Say it out loud. What's the next age? Fallen. Okay, let's go through where we're at. What was the first age? Form. Say it again. Second age? Third age? Fallen. Because we look at today's world and say, Mr. Ham, it's not perfect like it's pictured there originally in Genesis. What happened? Ask that question. Let's ask it again. What happened? In fact, you can go home, when you go home and you ask your parents for a picture of them when they were a young teenager, look at them now and you say, what happened? Okay? And that'll help you understand. It's just a good teaching tool, all right? So here's what happened. When God made Adam and Eve, the first two people, you know what? God didn't make us to be puppets. I'm sure you've seen puppets. I actually have a dinosaur puppet at home. I put it on my hand and I can make it turn around and make it bow its head down and I can make it do whatever it wants to do. God didn't make us like that. He wanted us to love him because we wanted to love him. And so he gave a test to Adam. Adam, you can eat of all the trees, all the trees. There's only one tree as a test of obedience you're not to eat because if you do, you will surely die. Well, along came the devil in the form of a serpent. He came to Eve. Eve, you can eat the fruit. You don't need to obey God's word. You decide what you want to do. And then Adam took the fruit. And when Adam took the fruit, he rebelled against God. And rebellion, that's called S-I-N. What's that word? Sin. And boys and girls, we all come from Adam and Eve. They're our parents. 6,000 years ago. And so when they sinned, then all of us who come from Adam, we have their nature. We have his nature. So we sin. Wait a minute. If you're a sinner... See, God is holy, God is pure, God is perfect. And someone who's a sinner can't live with a holy God. We'd be separated from God. And that's what happened immediately. And Adam and Eve knew something was wrong and they tried to make clothes for themselves out of fig leaves. You know what the Bible tells us? God made clothes out of animal skins for Adam and Eve. When you come to the Creation Museum, you'll actually see where we have a diorama we're, we're, well, actually, it's a life-size exhibit with Adam and Eve, and they're clothed in skins of, a, of animals, and you see the animals slain, and you see the blood from the animals. Do you know what God was doing right then, boys and girls? He was actually telling Adam and Eve, there has to be the payment for sin. You sinned against a holy God, and so, so there has to be a payment for sin. And because blood represents life, and because of sin, you're going to die. Your body's going to die. By the way, we're different to the animals. When our bodies die, that's not the end of us. Because we're made in the image of God, we have a soul that would live, that's going to live forever. But as sinners, we'd be separated from God forever. But he wants us to live with him. And so you know what he was telling Adam and Eve here? Killing that animal and putting those clothes on you is a picture that one day someone will come who will die and take away your sin. And who would that one be? Jesus. And that's why the Israelites sacrificed animals over and over and over again. We don't sacrifice animals today. Why? Because now Jesus has come. God's son stepped into history 2,000 years ago to be the babe in a manger, the God-man, to die on a cross and be raised from the dead and offers a free gift of salvation. And boys and girls, that's the most important message in the whole universe that every one of us has said, Lord Jesus, I receive that free gift from you. I put my faith and trust in you. I recognize I'm a sinner and I want to spend eternity with you. Wow. Isn't that the best gift of all? It is. It's a priceless gift. And boys and girls and mums and dads and teachers, we need to make sure every one of us has received that gift so we know we're going to spend eternity with the Lord. Well, you know, Bible makes it clear, death came into the world after sin. You can't have dead dinosaurs millions of years before man. It had to come after sin. So all these fossils had to be after sin. 
And you can imagine now the headlines in the newspaper in the Garden of Eden. Adam sins, the world's in chaos. You know what we're told in the New Testament? The whole creation groans. So when you're looking at today's world, you're not looking at the world as God made it. You're looking at the world that God made that's now been affected by sin. Our sin. You see, God said you will die. You know what the Bible tells us, boys and girls? Did you know that God holds everything together by the power of his word? He holds you together right now. And when he held everything together perfectly, nothing would wear out. But when when Adam sinned, God withdrew some of that power so that now everything starts to run down. The whole universe runs down. We run down. Our bodies run down. And we die. And all the bad things we see in the world are because we sinned against God. It's not God's fault. You know what God did? He stepped into history to save us from the bad things we did. So God threw Adam and Eve out of the Garden of Eden so they wouldn't eat of the tree of life in their sinful state and live forever in their sinful state. He put angels to guard the way back in. The only way back to the tree of life is through the Lord Jesus and what he did on the cross. And then thorns came into the world because of sin. Now it's a difficult place because there are thorns. Because the evolutionists tell us there's thorns in the fossil record hundreds of millions of years old. That doesn't make sense. Thorns came after sin. And now it's hard to, to get food. You have to work hard. There are weeds. Who's ever helped their parents pull weeds from a garden? Have you done that? Okay. The next time you're pulling out weeds, here's what you do. I have sinned, I have sinned, I have sinned. Just to remind you, it's because of our sin that there are weeds and we have to do that. Then animals started to change their diet. I don't know, they might have had a turkey roast or something like that. But boys and girls, the whole world started to change because of our sin. Well, the Bible says Adam and Eve had sons and daughters. And to tell you how bad sin is, in the first generation of children, Cain kills his brother Abel. He's the world's first terrorist. And then by the time of a man called Noah, about 1,600 years later, the world was so wicked that God said, Enough! I'm going to judge the wickedness of man. The whole world had rebelled against God except a man called Noah and his family. And God said, Noah, I want you to build a great big ark, a great big ship, because we're now coming to the fourth age of dinosaurs, which is what? Flood. Big loud voice. What's the first age of dinosaurs? Second age. Third age. Fourth age. No, I want you to build a great big ship. Now listen carefully. And God said, I'm going to send to you. No, I didn't have to go out and get them. I'm going to send to you two of every, seven of some, but two of every kind of land dwelling, land dwelling, air breathing animal. And by the way, boys and girls, when God made the dry land on day three, he said that the dry land appear and the waters were gathered together into one place. The, it seems that the land was in one place. We believe there's only one big continent before the flood. We believe that split up because of the flood, which is what, where, where we are today. But originally one big continent. And God said... I'm going to send to you two of every, seven of some, but two of every kind of land-dwelling, air-breathing animal. Okay, sit up straight. All right, take a deep breath. Hands by your side. Okay, I'm going to see how good you are here, all right? Let me see. Do you think I can trick you? Hey, do you think an Australian can trick an American? Oh, yeah, it's very easy. Yeah, very easy. Okay, all right, you ready? Now listen carefully. God said, I'm going to send two of every, seven of some, but two of every kind of of land dwelling air breathing animal go on board Noah's Ark okay so I'm going to ask you questions and I want you to put your hand up we see how good you are here all right so put your hands up at count three one to three you people have gone to sleep let's try it again one to three too slow one to three okay it's better all right okay you ready so if you agree put your hand up so two of every kind of land dwelling air breathing animal go on board Noah's Ark okay who agree elephants went on board the ark that was that was pathetic that was really bad. Let's try it again. Who agree? Elephants went on board. Okay, who agree? Deer went on board. Okay, who agree? Giraffes went on board. Okay, who agree? Camels went on board. Okay, who agree? Fish went on board. Aha! Uh-huh. <laughs> See, you weren't thinking, were you? Fish. Let me describe a fish to you. Land-dwelling, air-breathing animal. Is that a fish? 
No, he didn't need an aquarium on the ark. He sailed in an aquarium. Oh, dear, oh dear, boys and girls. Right. Okay, you think I can trick you next time? Okay, here we go. You ready? Who agree? Cattle kind was on the ark. Cattle. Cows. <laughs> What's wrong with you people? <laughs> Don't you understand English? All right, we'll start again. Who agree? Hippos were on the ark. Deer on the ark. Blue whale was on the ark. Oh, that's better. Okay, you didn't need to take the blue whale on the ark. Okay, I got you this time. Here we go. You ready? Who agree? Kangaroos are on the ark. Koalas are on the ark. Wombats are on the ark. Dinosaurs are on the ark. Who thinks dinosaurs were on the ark? Who thinks they weren't on the ark? Who's not sure if they're on the ark? Who wants to know if they're on the ark? Who put their hand up five times? I only asked four questions. Okay, are you ready? Did God send two of every kind of land animal? Were dinosaurs land animals? Was it every kind of land animal? Were dinosaurs land animals? Was it every kind of land animal? Were dinosaurs land animals? Was it every kind of land animal? Were dinosaurs land animals? Was it every kind of land animal? Were dinosaurs land animals? Did dinosaurs go in the ark? Of course they did. Of course, people say, how could they fit? Well, remember, most dinosaurs were small. Some were the size of chickens. Some were smaller than that. Dinosaurs laid eggs, and the biggest egg we found is about the size of a football. We have real fossil dinosaur eggs at the Creation Museum. Even a stegosaur, when he has to have an egg, wasn't that big. There was one dinosaur who was a mosasaurus, the size of a mouse, when he has to have an egg. Now, Noah didn't take eggs on board. God sent kinds of land animals, and I, uh, he didn't necessarily have to take babies. I think God would have sent young adults to go on board. But the point is, very few of your dinosaur kinds were massive animals. Your sauropods were, were really the biggest, as far as we know. See, to give you an understanding here, Buddy Davis, who sculpted dinosaurs for our dinosaur exhibit at the Creation Museum, and he also was a singer, and he had his workshops at the Creation Museum, he came to Australia with me one year, and there he is holding crocodile eggs. And I said, Buddy, let me get a photograph of you with crocodile eggs. Okay. Now let me get a photograph of you holding a baby crocodile. Okay. Now let me get a photograph of you holding the mother crocodile. <laughs> no thanks. Because in a fallen world, you wouldn't want to do that, would you? You see, even big crocodiles once hatched out of tiny little eggs. Even your big sauropods once hatched out of tiny little eggs. And I suspect for the big sauropod types, even though when you come and see the ark in Kentucky, the ark that we built according to dimensions in the Bible, you'll see it's enormous and it's massive. But I suspect for the really big sauropods, God probably sent young adults. It would make sense to have healthy teenagers ready for the new world. And then there were boys and girls saying, Mr. Ham, but weren't there hundreds of dinosaurs? I've seen over 600 names of dinosaurs and you have all the other animals. How could Noah fit them on board? Great question. When you come to the ark, you'll find we have exhibits that explain it all. Because you know what the Bible says? God sent two of every kind. Not species. What word did I say? Kind. And the word kind comes from the Hebrew word min, that mums and dads and teachers in our classification system, kingdom farm class, order genus, family, uh, order family genus, species, we believe it equates more to the family level of classification. So if you look at dogs, there's all these different species of dogs. See them? But we believe there's only one kind of dog, and you know what it's called? Dog. Do you know how many dogs no one needed on the ark? Only two because God brought all this genetic information in dogs so you can get all these different species, but dogs always remain what? Dogs. We believe there's only one kind of cat, because if you go and look at cats, you can see whether it's lions or tigers, um, leopards, you look at all the different sorts of cats and you recognize that's a cat. You can, you can see it's a cat. We believe there's only one kind of cat. You can have different species, but one kind of cat. So you needed two cats. Now, dinosaurs, there were more than two. Because we, when you look at the number of families of dinosaurs, clearly the word dinosaur is sort of this term for a whole group of different types of land animals. And there's probably, we think, could be 80 kinds, maybe as few as 50. 
It's hard to tell because you can't tell uh, a lot of things about how they breed from the fossil record. But there's those that are like the Triceratops kind, those that are like the sauropod kind. So we think there's about 80, 80 families, um, so about 80 kinds of dinosaurs, far fewer than what people realize. With birds, there's a number of different kinds of birds. See, with dogs, there's only one kind of dog. With birds, there's different kinds of birds. You get the idea? And there's different kinds of dinosaurs. With cats, we believe there's one kind. Do you know, we have, the reason we have our zoo and petting zoo at the Ark and our petting zoo at the Creation Museum, for instance, we have a zorse and a zonkey and a zebras and donkeys to show that they're all part of the horse kind. We have alpacas and llamas and camels to show they're all part of the camel kind. And so God only need two of the camel kind on the ark. He only need two of the horse kind on the ark. He only needed two of the dog kind on the ark, two of the cat kind, two of each of the dinosaur kinds, two of each of the bird kinds. And so far fewer numbers of animals on the ark than we think. In fact, overestimating, we would say there are about 1,700 kinds, but we even think it's less than that. And so here are the dinosaurs and kangaroos going on board the ark and going inside the ark. You know the sad thing? Here's the sad thing. A lot of children's books and a lot of children's nurseries and you know, children's areas in churches have Noah's Ark looking like an overloaded bathtub with giraffes sticking out the chimney about to sink at any moment. <laughs> Did Noah's Ark look like that? No. In fact, we have an exhibit at the Ark called Fairy Tale Arks. Here are pictures of children's books, and we bought a ton of them. And look, they usually show Noah's Ark as a fairy tale ark, as an overloaded bathtub about to sink at any moment. Look at it. Look at all these. Noah's Ark didn't look like those. That's why we have the fairy tale ark exhibit right there at the ark. And we remind mums and dads, you see, the world doesn't want you to believe in Noah's Ark. They don't want you to believe in the flood. They want you to think the Bible is a fairy tale. Why do we help them make it look like a fairy tale? And that's why we have this sign there in that exhibit, the devil saying, if I can convince you the flood was not real, I can convince you that heaven and hell are not real. And mum and dad, I'm going to challenge us that we need to get rid of the bathtub arcs. Oh, they're cute. They're cute. But I suggest they're dangerous. Because the world wants us to believe, wants your children to believe Noah's Ark is a fairy tale. Can you imagine what, what would happen? You know, the, the, the biggest comment I get as soon as people come to the Ark and they come on that bus from the parking lot and we come up the valley and they see the Ark. I love to be sitting in those buses sometimes and I hear all the boys and girls going, Oh, wow. It's so big. While the election was on, I heard over and over again, It's huge. It's enormous. Wow. You know, and, and they suddenly realize it's not like those little bathtub arcs we have in our books. This was real. So you know what, boys and girls? What we're going to do today, we're going to sink the bathtub arc. Are you ready? And on the count of three, when I count to three, one, two, three, I want you to put your hand in the air and go, yay. So we're going to do a practice run. Are you ready? One, two, three, yay! All right. Okay, we're going to sink the bathtub ark once, once and for all. On the count of three, are you ready? One, two, three, yay! You know what? I so hate bathtub arcs, we're going to do it again. Are we ready? We're going to sink the bathtub ark again. On the count of one, two, three, yay! Hey, you know what, mums and dads? See how different the real looking ark, according to the mentions of the Bible, is compared to the bathtub arcs. You know, one of the most asked questions in the world today and one of the accusations against the Bible, Noah couldn't fit all the animals on the ark. Of course he couldn't fit them on the ark if it's a bathtub ark. You know, I just saw one of the latest Veggie Tales book on Noah's Ark. Noah's Ark with the overloaded bathtub and the giraffe sticking out. And no wonder kids are led astray. And the other thing to remember is Noah's Ark is a picture of Jesus. You see, 
God's son stepped into history and said, I am the door by me. If any man enters in, he'll be saved. And Noah's ark is a picture of salvation. See that door we have on the side of the ark? And this past Christmas, I had all of our children and grandchildren go down there. As you can see, this one, this one over here wasn't there at the time. He was there at the time, but he, he, wasn't, he wasn't there at the time. But there he is in front of the ark. And we took that picture in front of the ark, in front of the door. And you know, I, uh, probably the most popular photo spot in the whole ark is that door. And we have an exhibit reminding people, no and his family went through a door to be saved. We need to go through a door to be saved. And there's some of our grand grandkids standing there with us at that door with a cross on it. And it's a reminder to do all we can to see our children go through the door of that ark to be saved. And that door being the Lord Jesus Christ. Boys and girls, can you imagine? Can you imagine if you were there in Noah's day and you're on the ark, Noah was preaching, the whole world had rebelled, and only Noah and his family went through that door to be saved. And then the door shut because God shut the door. You wouldn't want to be outside the ark, would you? You know what, boys and girls? There's another judgment coming on this earth. It's not by water next time. What's it by? Fire. And that's the final judgment. And God's provided an ark of salvation for us. And that's the Lord Jesus Christ. And so make sure that you're inside that ark of salvation. You put your trust and faith in the Lord Jesus. Uh, a lot of parents, teachers often ask us for that video clip. Actually, we have a DVD that has many of the geology videos that we have at the Ark, uh, not the Ark, the museum. Uh, we have many of the geology videos at the museum, and they're on this DVD, and so is that clip. While the fountains of the deep broke open, only those that were in Noah's Ark were saved. Those outside of the Ark were judged because of, of their wickedness. And only those animals and only those dinosaurs on board the ark were saved. Those outside obviously drowned, covered by mud and turned into fossils. Actually, if there really was a worldwide flood, you'd expect to find billions of dead things buried in rock layers, laid down by water all over the earth. And you know what we find? Billions of dead things buried in rock layers, laid down by water all over the earth. Can you say that together? Let's say it together. You ready? Billions of dead things buried in rock layers, laid down by water all over the earth. Okay. I want to see how good you are, see if you can learn it real quickly, and I'm going to turn the screen off for a moment and see if you can say it without the words. But let's just say it again quickly. If there really was a worldwide flood, you'd expect to find billions of dead things buried in rock layers laid down by water all over the earth. Okay, see how good you are. Learn it real quick. Billions of dead things buried in rock layers laid by water all over the earth. Okay, you got it? If there really was a worldwide flood, let's say it. You'd expect to find billions of dead things buried in rock layers laid down by water all over the earth. Excellent. And that's exactly what you find. See, remember, you couldn't have all these dead things millions of years before Adam sinned. Death came after sin. And by the way, boys and girls, it doesn't take millions of years to make a fossil. 
There are places in the world where you can take like a little fluffy teddy bear toy and put it in this mineral pool and it'll become fossilized. It'll become uh, like, uh, like a, a, a tree that turns into stone, petrifo petrification. Well, here's one of my favorite fossils. It's a fossil hat from Australia. And someone left it in a mine in 1830. They dug it out 50 years later and found it changed from a soft hat into a hard hat. Does it take millions of years to make a fossil? <laughs> no, it doesn't. In fact, you imagine if you go home and you find out that your pet cat just died. Sorry about that. But I can't stand cats. That's why I use cats. Okay. If I'd have been in Noah's Ark, there might not be any cats today. I just want you to know that. But if your cat, pet cat just died and you say, Mom and Dad, and his name's Earl. I don't want Earl to die. Well, he's dead. I know what I'll do. I'll put him on the front yard and I'm going to fossilize him. You put, a, you put a sign there and it says, Dead cat fossilizing. Do not touch. And then like a really good student, you get your piece of note paper and you start taking notes. Day one. Dead cat on grass. Day seven. Smelly dead cat on grass. Day ten. Very, very smelly dead cat on grass. Day twelve. Bits of Earl missing. Day 30, more of Earl missing. Day 45, where is Earl? Because <laughs> you know what happens today, don't you? When an animal dies, it decays. In fact, we had a deer die in the woods not far from our house. And you know what? Within a couple of months or so, there's hardly anything left of it. People, how do you make a fossil? You've got to cover something quickly to preserve it. How do you make billions of fossils all over the earth in layers that are global in extent? Man, you'd need a massive amount of water and a massive amount of mud that sounds like what? The flood, exactly. Well, the ark lands and the animals come out, including the dinosaurs, all lined up to have their photographs taken. Like typical Americans, they sold T-shirts. I survived the flood. And here they are, moving away from the ark. And then I had boys and girls say, Mr. Ham, is there anything in the Bible that could explain dinosaurs? I know dinosaur was a made-up word in 1841, but that the animals that, that they put under the, the name dinosaur, is anything in the Bible that, that even talks about them? Actually, here's the interesting thing. I think that there's a description of an animal in the dinosaur. It's one, a, an animal in the Bible. It's one of the most detailed descriptions of a land animal in the whole Bible, and I think it could be a dinosaur. Because God said to Job, Job, look at this animal behemoth. Can you say behemoth? Behemoth, which I made with you, eats grass like an ox. Everything about him is big and powerful. His strength is in his hips, the power in his stomach muscles. His ribs are like bars of iron. He's the first of the ways of God. In other words, it's, what, it's probably the largest land animal God made. He moves his tail like a cedar. And it's, everything about it's enormous. It must have this enormous tail. You know what's interesting? In some of the Bible commentaries, the notes, not what's in the text of the Bible, the notes, uh, and, and some of the study Bibles, like the NIV study Bible, in the notes, someone wrote this. Possibly a hippopotamus or an elephant. Did that sound like a hippo or an elephant to you? Look, I spent all day once at the Cincinnati Zoo. People thought I was nuts. I was getting photographs of elephants. They wanted the elephant to turn around and get a photograph from the front. I got excited when he turned around and I could get a photograph of his behind. And people said to me, what are you doing? I said, behold, behemoth. He has a tail like a cedar. A cedar? Yeah, look, it reminds you of a big cedar tree. Look at it. There. Look at that one. How about those? And they said, no, 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 that's ridiculous. Okay. Well, it must have been a hippo then. Guess what I did? I got photographs of rear ends of hippos. <laughs> Behold, behemoth. <laughs> he has a tail like a cedar. <laughs> oh, now look at that cedar tree if ever I've seen one. Dear, oh dear. Some people just don't think, do they? Here's a tail like a cedar. Do you think it fits a hippo? No. How about an elephant? No. How about a dinosaur? 
See, I don't believe Behemoth was an elephant or a hippo. I think it's more like something like a big sauropod dinosaur. You know why there are many people that say, no, that can't be? Because you know what they say? Because dinosaurs lived millions of years ago. Guess what question I asked them? Were you there? Exactly. You know, an evolutionist said in a book, there's a petroglyph, an Indian carving, a National Bridges National Monument that bears striking resemblance to what? A dinosaur. So we sent some people out there, and there you see the carving. There's the original. We've enhanced it for you. And uh, there we have someone doing a wax cloth impression of it, and it looks like a dinosaur. It's interesting. There are other carvings around there. When you talk to the park rangers, what's this deer? What's that bird? What's this dog? What's this one here? Don't know. Could it be a dinosaur? No, no, dinosaurs didn't live with people. Then we say, what were you there? And you know, boys and girls, there's been a lot of instances recently where scientists have actually found blood cells, soft tissue in a dinosaur bone. This was even on a documentary on the Discovery Channel. And the scientist who first discovered this, Dr. Schweitzer, she's gone on and discovered lots of other instances. You know what they find? We found many, many instances now where you dissolve out the mineralization in dinosaur bones and you can actually find soft tissue. And uh, you, it, it's incredible. And the, the evolutionists are saying, well, you know what that means? Somehow, and we don't know how, somehow dinosaur bones are preserved for millions of years and they still have soft tissue in them. You know what we say? They're not millions of years old. Did you see a sign like this in the way to the auditorium? Were you worried about this animal jumping out? <laughs> no, because we now come to the sixth age of dinosaurs, which is what? Faded. Okay, let's run through them. What's the first age? Form. Second age? Fearless. Third age? Fallen. Fourth age? Flood. Fifth age? Faded. What happened to the dinosaurs? Well, you know, evolutionists have all sorts of ideas. Maybe they died of indigestion. They died of overeating. They went on one of those diets you see on TV. They got hit by an asteroid. They died in the Ice Age. But I'm telling you, it's real simple. Every, we know what happened to the dinosaurs. I know. And I can sum it up for you in two words. Are you ready? Here's what happened to the dinosaurs. They died. Okay, let's see if you got it. Ready? What happened to the dinosaurs? They died. They died. Now, boys and girls, dinosaurs are fascinating, but they're really no mystery. Oh, let me go back here. They're really no mystery. Dinosaurs are fascinating, but they're really no mystery. You see, here's the thing. Lots of animals have become extinct. See, if I was to call up the, a zoo and say, you have an endangered species program? Yes. Why? Why? Because lots of animals have become extinct. Lots? You mean not just dinosaurs? Oh, no. Lots of animals have become extinct, and there's only a few of these left in the wild, and there's only a few of these in captivity. There's hundreds and hundreds of types that, are, that have gone extinct. Oh, okay. Why do animals be go, go extinct? Why? Everyone knows why they go extinct. People killing them, killing each other, diseases, catastrophes, all sorts of reasons. Oh, what happened to the dinosaurs? Oh, we don't know. If you put the dinosaur... Saws, they're just land animals, land animal kinds with all the other land animal kinds alongside of Adam and Eve. Sin and the curse affected the world. Two of each kind got on board Noah's Ark. They came off the Ark. And because of the flood, actually, there's been some dramatic climate change because of the flood. People think climates are changing today when you have a little quarter degree difference. That's nothing compared to climate change that's happened because of the flood. And in fact, if you don't understand the flood and the ice age generated by the flood, you're not going to understand climate change at all. And today, unfortunately, there's a lot of untrue things said out there about climate change. Climates change, but they can change very rapidly and very quickly. Trouble with a lot of the younger generation today, they, they just haven't done their research to know there was a time not long ago when we were warned there's going to be another ice age. Then suddenly they're talking about global warming. And uh, the, even uh, volcanic eruptions can change the whole temperature of the earth by one degree, which is much more than the changes you see today, because there's a lot going on about money and political control and all the rest of it. But anyway, but the, the point is, over time after the flood, lots of animals have become extinct due to changing conditions. I mean, the Sahara Desert used to be a lush jungle, basically. And because of climate change, and that's before the industrial era, uh, because of climate change, because this world is suffering from sin, the effects of the flood, and uh, lots of animals have become extinct. And so the dinosaurs, as far as we know, all those land animals are extinct. And then we come to found... Did I say the last one was the sixth age? That was the fifth age. This is the sixth age. 
So, what was the first age? Second age? Third age? Fourth age? Fifth age? Sixth age? Found. Here's the thing. When was dinosaurs first discovered? Well, you know, there were some people in England in the 1800s who discovered dinosaur bones, but that's not when dinosaurs were first discovered. I want you to tell me, who would have been the first human being ever to discover what we call today a dinosaur? Adam, that's right, Adam, Adam and Eve, the first two people, actually. And you know what else? Mums and dads, you might have to explain this uh, to, to your children or teachers later on, but we'll do the best we can right now. Look, boys and girls, if you say dinosaurs live with people, the evolutionists will mock at you and scoff at you and say that's stupid and ridiculous. There's no way. I mean, dinosaurs died out 65 million years ago. They evolved 200 million years ago. There's no way they live beside people. You know why they say that? Because they have dinosaurs evolving into birds. But here's an interesting thing. From an evolutionist perspective, you know the horseshoe crab? Well, I've been to Ripley's Aquarium in Gatlinburg and they have a horseshoe crab and here's what they say. The horseshoe crab survived unchanged for over 300 million years. One of the most ancient living creatures on earth. They existed 100 million years before dinosaurs. In other words, what they're saying is evolutionists say, now I don't agree with the millions of years, but they say Horseshoe crab lived 100 million years before dinosaurs evolved 200 million years ago, then dinosaurs became extinct, but horseshoe crabs lived all that time, supposedly, and horseshoe crabs live today beside people. They mock at us for saying dinosaurs live with people, and yet horseshoe crabs live with people, and from their own beliefs, horseshoe crabs existed before dinosaurs. See how inconsistent they are? Here's another one. The chambered nautilus at the Ripley's Aquarium they tell you that it supposedly evolved 200 million years before dinosaurs. Supposedly been here for 400 million years, it lives today beside people. You know another one? The crocodile. In Australia there was a sign on a crocodile pen that said the crocodile body plan has not changed in over 240 million years. It's older than the dinosaurs. According to evolutionists, crocodiles existed before dinosaurs and then they lived with dinosaurs. Crocodiles lived today beside people. But if you believe dinosaurs live with people, they will mock and scoff at you because they have to have, for their fairy tale, they have to have dinosaurs evolving into birds. And so then we come to the last age of dinosaurs, the seventh age, which is what? Fiction. Okay, let's see how good we are. You ready? First age is? Second age? Third age? Fourth age? Fifth age? Sixth age? Seventh age? What does fiction mean? Not true. Name me two things that are not true. Evolution and millions of years. Boys and girls, about an hour and a half from the Creation Museum is the Indianapolis Children's Museum and it's said to be the best children's museum in America. Actually they're wrong. The best children's museum in America is the Creation Museum. <laughs> it really is. And another one that's the best children's museum in America is the Ark. But you know when you go to the Indianapolis Children's Museum you see a lot of fiction indoctrinating children because when you go through there you see these signs millions of years 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 the signs go on for millions of years millions of years millions 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 of years millions of years all these children getting indoctrinated in millions of years millions of years you know what i call that what's the seventh age of dinosaurs fiction hey when they found those fossils did they have labels on them saying hi i'm millions of years old no of course not Hey, you know what, boys and girls? I have a special name for dinosaurs. I call them missionary lizards. Can you say missionary lizards? You know why? Because dinosaurs enable me to tell boys and girls about God's word and the gospel. Here's a dinosaur bone. Who agrees it's dead? Okay. So when you look at a dinosaur bone through the Bible, you know death came into the world because of sin. And because Adam sinned, that's why we died. The Bible says the wages of sin is what? death but even though our bodies die we will live forever because we're made in the image of God we'd be separated forever from God but God loved us so much he wants us to live with him so while we were still sinners say the last four words for me Christ died for us 
And if we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in our heart God has raised him from the dead, we will be saved. Hey, boys and girls, mums and dads, teachers, the most important message in the entire universe, the reason that I do what I do is because I want people to know the truth about the history of the world and about the fact that God created everything. He created our grandparents a long time ago, Adam and Eve. We sinned against God. That's why we die. But God has a wonderful message for us. He stepped into history. The babe in a manger, we date our calendars from that time, 2,000 years ago, to die on a cross, be raised from the dead. And if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, believe in your heart God has raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. If you are not sure that you're saved, if you are not sure that you're in that ark of salvation, can I plead with you, talk to your teachers, talk to your parent, uh, one of the pastors of the church, just say, I want to make sure that I'm saved. I want to receive that free gift of salvation. Well, you know what, boys and girls? Uh, I tell you what I'm going to do. I've got a special little gift for you, and I'll show you what it is. And if you're nice and quiet while I talk to the mums and dads just for a moment, then we'll let you come down and get these uh, at the end here. I have two special cards that I want to give you. And if anyone's watching online and they write to our ministry at Answers in Genesis, they can go to answersingenesis.org and then you'll find out ways that you can contact us and say, can you send my kids those two cards and we'll do that for you, okay? So a Tyrannosaurus rex is my favorite dinosaur. So we got this card and it says, created on day six, first seen by Adam and Eve, rediscovered 1874, diet vegetarian before seen. You get the idea? And on the other side, we have the seven ages of dinosaurs, form, fearless, fallen, flood, faded, found, fiction, okay? And then uh, you can learn those. And then the other card we have for you is this one. It has my favorite animal, the platypus, and all those fun things about a bill like a duck, bill like a tail, hair like a bear, etc. on there. Then on the back, the three sayings I want you to remember from this morning. First of all, millions of years ago, when somebody says that, what's the question you ask? Were you there? If there really was a worldwide flood, you'd expect to find what? Billions of dead things buried in rock layers laid down by water all over the earth. And then, when we look at animals today, they certainly didn't evolve by chance random processes. We say, what? It's designed to do what it does do, what it does do, it does do well, doesn't it? Yes, it does, I think it does, do you, I do, hope you do too, do you? Hey, you're doing very well. All right, everyone nice and quiet. Close your mouths, hands by your side, sit up straight. Shh. Excellent. Okay, mums and dads, evolution, millions of years, it's all used in this era of history through the whole world to try to take generations of kids away and capture them for the devil. And that's what's happened. And that's why we produce the materials we do. I urge you to bring your kids to the ark, to the museum. I tell you, it's life-changing. And you'll want to bring them back again at Christmas and see the Christmas programs. These are the two leading Christian-themed attractions in the world. And it's to help you to equip your kids and teach them the things of God. And then when they see all the other thousands of people there, and mums and dads and boys and girls, that has an effect on them. And then often <coughs> at the Creation Museum, you can also uh, get to meet some of our scientists as well who love God's Word. And we produce a whole range of materials for you. encourage you to go to our website, answersandgenesis.org. Thousands of articles there. But we have a You Choose program uh, where you can put together different combinations of books and DVDs. The Seven Seas, The Seven Ages of Dinosaurs is in this book, uh, Dinosaurs for Kids. It's got a lot of information about dinosaurs. It's actually good for parents to read as well as the kids. Then uh, we just came out with a new book that's for a little lower age level, Dinosaurs of Eden. And then how many animals were on the ark? This is based on the exhibits in the ark, and it'll answer that question. That's good for mums and dads. Sit down with all your family and read it. And another one, how could Noah look after them? How could they actually have air circulating through the ark? Do you know some of the ancient ships had a tube, they call it like a moon pool, and had water in it? And you imagine as the ship rocks back and forward, the water goes up and down and circulates the air. And they're saying, why wouldn't Noah have had something like that? There's all sorts of ingenious things to help you answer those questions. And a brand new book I just did for little kids on a special door and they lift up, lift up all the flaps inside there and we go through lots of little doors and things and then we of course challenge these kids and we have a prayer at the end for them to pray to receive Christ. Also did these rhyme books, they, you can have them just as rhyme books or 
they have teacher notes to go with them. You can use them as a little mini curriculum to teach a course uh, from them. So they're good for all of that, or for devotions in your home. The true account of Adam and Eve, dragons and dinosaurs, they're big fold-out books, they're very popular. This is an extremely popular one, The Flood of Noah. It folds it, you open it up and see all these pop-out things and so on. And then this teaches kids the true history of the world, starting with creation, six days, Adam and Eve, and how all the different cultures of the world fit together and folds out 15 feet. There's also a, a much more detailed 25-foot one out there as well. Uh, there's a book on dinosaurs for, say, 10 or 11-year-old upwards, and then answers books for kids, use these as devotions. Kids send us in the questions they have about the Bible and we answered them in these short devotions, middle school, younger. Actually, you could use them for any age. Sit down, a devotion for your little kids and you know what, the bigger kids can learn as well. A talk that's sort of similar to what I did uh, this morning. It's me with Buddy Davis and Buddy's singing and we have fun and we go through... Uh, the Bible and the seven seas of history and so on talking about dinosaurs and that's one that covers a lot of the sorts of material I did this morning and there's other DVDs out there by Buddy this one the creation adventure team a Jurassic Ark mystery this one six short days we also have here uh, 30 apologetics lessons for ages 7 through 12 to teach them apologetics and has color handout sheets to go with it uh, the answers books mums dads and teachers 120 of the top questions you're going to get in today's world that where people question the Bible uh, with answers. And if you equip yourselves with those books and those answers, you'll be able to answer most of the questions you hear out there. My book, The Lie, The Importance of the Book of Genesis, Why It Matters, Why We Need to Take a Stand. That's a good little textbook even for using for high schoolers, middle school, even high schoolers uh, and upwards on why we believe God's Word starting with Genesis. And I encourage you all to read Already Gone. We did the research on why two-thirds of young people leave the church in America. And it was all to do with the fact we haven't taught apologetics. And you know what? I see that in the Christian school movement. I see it in the homeschool movement that there's been a lack of teaching apologetics. It's, it's one thing to teach them what God's Word says. It's another to teach them how to defend their faith and get ready for this world that's going to attack their faith. And that's why we do what we do, and that's why I urge you to invest in bringing them to the Ark, the Creation Museum, and these resources. Six of my main talks done up as 12, 30-minute programs in a study curriculum that goes with it. Uh, I'd say 10, 11-year-old upwards. I've had kids even as young as 8 and 9 come to me even today and, and tell me they love my talks yesterday, and that was given to the whole church. You'd be surprised how young kids understand this information. And that's like a, an apologetics curriculum. There's the big fold-out chart. And then our Sunday school curriculum. You can use it as a homeschool Bible study curriculum, Christian school curriculum. It's three-year curriculum. Actually, in April, it starts off as a four-year curriculum. And we have some sample copies out there uh, for you. It goes through the entire Bible chronologically at every age level. So there's material for every age level. And it teaches apologetics, biblical authority, and um, teaches you doctrines. And one last thing, our Answers magazine, it has received many awards. It's one of the biggest Christian magazines in the world now. It's world class, has a mini magazine for kids in the middle. And if you subscribe, we'll give you a free DVD for each year that you subscribed. Uh, so with that, uh, we're going to uh, finish off here. Um, and I'll see if uh, I, I think maybe I have to finish off here, Zechariah, or is there someone to... Yeah, I'll finish off here. All right, so what we'll do is I'll give you a quick little test. Then I'll give you some instructions and uh, then I'll pray and dismiss us. And then at 11 o'clock, I'm doing a session in here from 11 to 12.30 for high schools. Totally different. We're talking about science confirms the Bible. So it's like being in a science class in high school. Okay. But anyone can stay for it. You're welcome to stay. All right. So you ready? Set up straight. Real quick test. Okay. On what day did God make dinosaurs? Six. Did dinosaurs go on the ark? Did they come off the ark? What happened to the dinosaurs? Is there, is there any mystery? No. no. Uh, did dinosaurs live alongside of people? Yes. Who were the first people to see dinosaurs? So was there death before sin or death after sin? After sin. Could you have had dead dinosaurs with diseases millions of years before Adam sinned? No. When God created everything, he said everything was what? Very good. And if there really was a worldwide flood, we'd expect to find what? 
Billions of dead things buried in rock layers laid down by water all over the earth. The next time somebody says millions of years, what do you ask them? Were you there? Excellent. I think you've learned it all very well. Here's what we're going to do. At the end, remember, we're not going to act out evolution, survival of the fittest, nature red in tooth and in claw. In an orderly fashion, you can come down here and actually um, maybe... Uh, well, I can get a couple of people, Jason, to spread more of these out because they're too confined. Some more of these out along the steps here, if we can do that. And you can come down and take one of each of these cards. If there's any school groups here, teachers could come down and get what they need for their school groups. And we've got more if we run out. But one of each. Nobody move yet. So we're going to pray, first of all. Okay? All right. Everyone close their eyes. Nice and quiet. Shh. Okay. A gracious, loving Heavenly Father, we just come before you today. Lord, here we are as human beings on this earth and, and we're bowing before our Creator, the one who made all things, the whole universe. And we recognize, Lord, that we're descendants of Adam. We recognize that we're sinners. But yet we know, Lord, that you love us so much that you sent your Son to earth to die on a cross for us and be raised from the dead. And I pray that every one of us, Lord, will not leave this place without knowing that we have confessed with our mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in our heart God has raised him from the dead and so that we know that we're saved in that ark of salvation. Help us to remember all these things. Help us to tell others about them and others about your word. And Lord, we ask that you would keep us safe now as we travel to our homes, our schools, or wherever we're going. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.